I uh, wanted to ask about the state sponsorship towards this uh, subject as well. OK. I'll, well, there's a lot to say about that. But uh, let me finish the, All right, okay, the, the first ahead. question. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that is, you know, our stance. One of the main problems in Sri Lankan archaeology is Sri Lankan archaeologists have not been able to evolve out of the model of the colonial archaeologists. That is the problem. Mm. I tell you what. So early on, when H.C.P. Bell was doing archaeology, he would go to the field with his laborers, and he would dig a hole and write a report, and that's. Archaeology is not out there. It is on the report that the archaeologists make. So that's a, that, that's a very crucial point there. That means when you dig, you actually destroy data. Because no one else can dig the same place again. Yeah. You dig and you take data out. OK? Very clear. Very simple. And in the process, you destroy in, some part yeah, of it. Yeah. I mean, that is what we teach. We also teach that you know, archaeological, uh, archaeological excavation is dis destroying data. But that's like you know doing an operation, you know, and then you shed blood. <laughs> you cannot do it without that. Mm. So, but we have also developed the modern archaeologists also developed so many other prospecting techniques. Mm -hmm. Let's let's put that. Yeah. But and then then it is your record which is left as archaeology. See, this is very important. What is archaeology? After excavation, it is the record. Mm -hmm. But how how do I know that the archaeologists did not? willingly put false notes in their record to prove something that he believes. You see, that's one of the major issues in archaeology. So you, during the colonial time, say, think of Mortimer Wheeler. He's Mortimer Wheeler is this great archaeologist who, if I remember correct, I think he's the one who um, worked in Mahandajaru Harappa. Oh, right. Forgive me if I'm wrong, but you know, he worked in one of those major, major sites. And he's also the founder of the Institute of Archaeology in London, of the University of London. So they were, they were army people. They would go to a site and with these you know, workers, laborers, and, and dig it and come out with this. That was the old days of doing archaeology. You know, the funny thing in Sri Lanka is we still do the same. With the archaeologists think that I am the big archaeologist. You go with your subordinates and a bunch of goliaths and dig a hole and come out with a report and say, see, this is archaeology. That is nonsense now. That is so unscientific. You need a reflexive environment when you do digging now. That means you need more than three or four professional archaeologists on site when you do a digging because you're also destroying national cultural property when you dig. That is why I, this is the criticism that you have. It's not, we do dig very well, to be honest. I have, you know, we teach, my institute is a very good institute. You know, we teach our kids very well. Um, it's, they are not kids, you know. They are. <laughs> but what I'm telling you is, like, the problem is not our technique, the way we think about archaeology, and the problem we, uh, the, the way we think, oh yeah, the mindset about excavation and fieldwork of archaeologists, that is, which is still colonial, in thinking. So, see, that's yeah. my point. Not the point that we we know, we know it very well. well. We are a nation built so many things, big stupas, this thing, and one of one. Why can't we do uh, dig in the hole? Yeah. <laughs> okay, sorry, a hole in the hole there and do, do digging. We can do it. I ask about the state sponsorship towards your subject. Oh, all right. Well, can't complain. They're doing it very well. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm surprised. You know, I didn't know how much the government is spending on archaeological research until I became the director of the institute. Mm -hmm. Well, it's surprising and it's an amazing amount of money given to my institute to do archaeological research. And we do a lot of archaeological research with government funds, not with international funds. I mean, um, it's an amazing. I mean, it's 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 surprising. Are there international donors to this? Yeah, we have. We have a lot oh, of right. donors. Right. Okay. I, mean, I tell you, like for example, my own institute spent 2.3 million rupees to study ola leaves. Mm -hmm. No, puskolapot. Oh yeah. And and preserving and that's government money. Mm. And we spent close to a million rupees annually for doing excavations and field work and artistry research. Of course, government input is a lot uh, through the Ministry of Education. Mm. I don't know who should I thank, but that's a great, great contribution. I mean, as usual, you always need more. <laughs> Only if you ask more, you get what you want. Yeah. Yeah. But there is some aspect that the government will have to look very soon, as I as I said. It's the, you, we need a much robust and a strong antiquities ordinance mm -hmm. to deal with heritage, archaeological heritage, and cultural property in the country. So we're thinking of huge development. 
and lots of tourists coming, lots of money in the cultural and heritage field. You may not realize, do you, how much money that the culture and heritage of Sri Lanka is bringing into Sri Lanka. Any tourist who spends five days in the country will spend three days in the cultural regions, in Anuradha, Purapol, Naru and Kandy. The sea and the beach is only two days. That's the average. So it is the heritage, it is the culture of Sri Lanka that brings money into country. There's so much money, so much potential for economic development within heritage and culture if we you know, plan it very well. So, for you to do that, you need a very strong, very far-sighted, but very carefully devised antiquities ordinance. Our antiquities ordinance already have something called archaeological impact assessment. Say, if you are a developer, if you want to develop something, your site has to be first passed through this um, archaeological impact assessment. But you see, well, having a clause making it necessary for one to do archaeological impact assessment is not enough. You have to have a strong mechanism how to do it. That kind of fine tuning is very much needed. And the process should be in you know, a very effective way. Very effective way. And also like, you know, how should an archaeologist do archaeology as, as needs also to be kind of, you know, mentioned within, the, uh, within these um, documents. And the most serious issue I see is like, you know, in India, you. Even if you have, I'll say, you are a good, uh, you get big funding from, from somewhere, you want to do archaeological work in India. But if you do archaeological work in India, say that you're, you're coming from Germany or England, you cannot do it on your own. You have to work with Indian archaeologists. All right. Not for namesake, but you have to really work with them. And your project has to train Indian archaeologists. Mm -hmm. And we, but not so in Sri Lanka. Few of the best sites in Sri Lanka are done solely by international archaeologists, uh -huh. which is, I see, I mean, I think, I think it's a crime. Right. I think it's not just, a, well, forgive me, let's take the word crime, I think it's so wrong. Uh -huh. It's so wrong by my culture right to my past. You see, if international people are doing archaeology here, they must do two things. They must work with archaeologists in our universities. Point to, and, and those money that they bring in must train our PhDs and MAs. If they, I mean they, they, I mean that's how they do it in India. You cannot do it otherwise in India. That's the, the other weakest point in our legislation. Is there a body uh, in place uh, to approve uh, those kind of uh, practices like you know, the foreign people coming and doing the research work in Sri Lanka without the influence of the Sri Lankan people? Now was, I, have to put, I cannot put my friends in trouble in, 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 in the public media <laughs> where it's the Department of Archaeology. All right, okay. But it does, it, there, is, there is no clause in our antiquities ordinance or our standing orders that makes it mandatory mm -hmm. that you're okay. If, you, if this is an international collaboration, there should be a white paper kind of yeah. thing, like okay, if this is an international collaboration, it should work with archaeologists from our universities. Mm -hmm. I, I'm not saying they're from my institute, from any university. And it should support minimum three or two MAs and one PhD. There's no we, such clause, right? No such clause. That's uh, totally unfair. I think it's, that's so wrong. Well, I, I would say it's, it's a crime. Okay, that's about the archaeology. You're watching uh, the Crossfire and exclusive production of the government information department. Uh, very informative, uh, Professor, we have with us Professor Jagat Virasinghe, director of the uh, Postgraduate Institute of Archaeology. Professor, you stressed about uh, the uh, uh, heritage and culture and how it can uh, bring uh, the foreign revenue to Sri Lankan development and the community development. Do you think that we have a proper mechanism in place to project ourselves, uh, especially when it comes to national heritage and uh, culture, uh, to the international community to develop it to, you know, to a certain level? No, I don't think so. We have, have it as yet. Well, that's where I see our, our role as uh, educators have failed. Mm -hmm. We haven't really you know, trained people on heritage management and cultural tourism and heritage economics, we haven't done any of those things. So we, won't, we have only just begun to, to do these things. Because, uh, because, you know, as I see it, being, you know, I've been involved with uh, heritage sec sector for a while now. Mm -hmm. I've developed craft project and art projects and, and all that. And we have not been able to, you know, 
teach this lesson to our policymakers and the politicians. They don't know the potential in heritage and culture. You see, if a tourist comes to Sri Lanka, as I, you know, if you spend five days, three days of, the, of his five days, he spends it on Radhapura, Pol Narva, and uh, Candy. Candy and these places. Only two days on the beach. Mm -hmm. but, we, but we think it is, Sri Lanka is all about beach. That, that, no, they are not coming for beach here. They are coming here because of its culture and ecology and all that. So, And uh, we can actually use that that potential in heritage. Do you know how many people come to Sigiri a day on a particular week? I mean, it's, we earn about a million rupees, close to a million rupees a day at Sigiri. And the number of, you know, the local tourism itself is it's so huge. Mm -hmm. And so what I see of heritage and economic development, community development, is that we can use heritage as a way to bring in wealth from the center to the periphery. It's from Colombo money to the villages, or the money in London to, to the villages, in a very sweet and a beautiful way. If only if you, prob I mean, you know, manage heritage within, well, you have to develop, we have to develop our own ways of you know, managing heritage. Heritage is not something that belongs in the past, point one. Heritage is not a form of objectified past. Heritage is a process. This is the thing. This is the way that you have to look at heritage. You cannot think of heritage as something that pulls you backward. No, heritage is not against development. It's a forward-looking science. But each time we talk about heritage and culture, we think only we in the world have culture and heritage. <laughs> we see like, you know, in America, they don't have culture. Isn't that the popular notion? Well, no. People in America have their culture. They respect their parents. They love their parents. They send presents to their, their mothers for, and parents on, on birthdays. They have their systems of, of you know, system of culture and, and values, just as much as we have. We are not the only people who have some past in the world. The Chinese, look at, well, shall I touch on this, our problem with our, our past? Yeah. And the way we think of Do you remember the way the Chinese did the Olympic Beijing opening. I keep repeating this wherever I go, because I think China is a country that has even an older history than ours. I mean, it's, it's a great history. They, they found gunpowder, um, ink, and writing, what not, you know, everything of the ancient world, of everything important in technology came from China, like, you know. Where was it first found, you say, in China? That kind of thing. But you see, if you look at, look at Chinese Beijing Olympics, how did they portray themselves? How did they imagine the future of China? It was all about their past, but at the same time, it's all about their future. Just imagine how we would have done it. If we had Olympics, we would put, an, put a pillar from Anuradhapura and some Candian dancers and Sabaragamo dancers and think that's, that's what we are. No, we are not just past. I mean, we have a great past, but also we have a great future. So we are also in a process of, of changing. So heritage is not objectified past. Heritage is a cultural process that looks into the future. So if you take heritage in this sense and develop heritage and heritage tourism and, and community development linked with it, you know, the potential is immense. I mean, I don't, I mean, well, look how, how Japan, um, Japan has done it. The Chinese are doing it. And well, Indians are only just beginning to do it.